Hey everybody, happy Friday. My name is Mark Medeiros. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Peninsula Open Space Trust. And on behalf of POST, as well as the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District and the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, I wanna welcome you to part two of our wildlife tracking webinar series with Pathways for Wildlife. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land and post working area has been home to many distinct communities of native people since time immemorial. We work to care and conserve these lands. The ancestral territory of the Amamutsun, Muwekma Ohlone, Rame Tushalone, and Tamian Nation. These indigenous communities have survived centuries of displacement and are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Wherever you are, please pause to acknowledge the native people whose land you are on and consider how you could support them. And we also welcome any members of native communities who might be joining us today. Um, all right, so very quickly, because I shared this last time, uh, I want to just describe post a little bit for you by sharing this map. Peninsula Open Space Trust uh, has worked since 1977 to protect land in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Northern Santa Cruz counties. This amounts to about 80,000 acres now, most of which has been transferred to public agency partners to be operated as public preserves that you could all visit for the benefit of all community members here in the Bay Area. And of course, this work has been possible thanks to thousands of community members who support us. Many of our donors are probably watching today uh, we want to say thank you. It's a huge team effort that we're all doing to um, protect this land that we we hold so dear around here. So um, kudos to all of us for all the work that's been done in past decades and continues into the future. So next, I want to describe a bit about our partners for this event, starting with Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District. Created in 1972, Midpen is an independent special district that has preserved over 65,000 acres of public land and manages 26 open space preserves, ranging from 55 to over 18,000 acres. These preserves are open to the public free of charge, 365 days a year, and visitors will find over 240 miles of trails ranging from easy to challenging terrain. Next, I'd like to acknowledge the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, which works to protect the quality of life in Santa Clara County by preserving open space and natural resources. Since 1993, the authority has protected over 25,000 acres of open space, natural areas, watersheds, and wildlife habitat, providing ecologically friendly outdoor recreation for all residents of the area. And I'm gonna share a little bit more about pathways for wildlife momentarily. But first, I want to again show you this cool map of wildlife movement in our area. As a reminder, we shared last time about the work that POST and our partners are doing, um, not only to create public access and connected trail networks throughout this region so that we as humans can enjoy all of these protected natural lands, but also working on a variety of wildlife habitat restoration, wildlife studies, and wildlife connectivity projects throughout this whole area. And today, Pathways for Wildlife is going to be sharing more information about advanced wildlife tracking and tips and tricks around how to identify wildlife tracks. But they're also going to focus a little bit more about the wildlife connectivity research that is occurring in the southern part of our working area in southern uh, Santa Clara County with uh, partners such as MidPen and OSA and Post as well as the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency and others. So uh, if you forgot or didn't attend last time, I um, want to quickly describe Pathways for Wildlife for you in Tanya and Ahiga. Pathways for Wildlife is conducting groundbreaking wildlife research in our area with a variety of nonprofits and public agency partners. They're at the center of many, many different uh, studies going on in the area. 
using camera traps, wildlife coloring technology, and other complex methods. Tanya Diamond and Ahiga Sandoval of Pathways for Wildlife are constructing a complex picture of how wildlife move across our landscape and what we need to do to enhance the health of these animal communities. So with that, I'm going to welcome Tanya and Ahiga to the program. Hey, uh, hey Tanya. How are hey, you Mark, doing? thank you for that introduction. Thank no you. Problem. I know you both have been real busy coming off of another um, sort of conference workshop this morning. So thanks for making the time. And thank you to everybody who's in um, chat already saying hello. Feel free to shout out and say hello in chat. Um, I think you'll probably handle questions, maybe a combination of at the end and maybe if you see them during the presentation like last time, right? Yeah, definitely, yeah. We welcome all questions, definitely during the presentation, we can stop on a slide and go over something. That would be really fun. There was lots of good questions last time, especially with our uh, direct messaging. So thank you to everybody. That was fun. Cool. Well, um, it's gonna be a busy hour. Uh, I got to see your slides. They look awesome. So I'm just going to um, get out of the way, let you two do your thing. Thanks for joining us again. Our Thanks pleasure. For Thanks for having us. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Wildlife okay. Tracking Part 2, uh, a little bit more advanced tracking we're going to get into. And uh, to set the tone, um, because we've... Uh, we have a good community and tracking in the tracking community. I like to tell you a little saying from my culture. It's a Navajo tracking saying. I think this is good to help set the tone. And it goes like this. I'd like to share with you. Okay. So it goes, the birder heard it. The herpetologist seen it. And the botanist scented it. But the tracker, the tracker experienced it. And that's what we're doing here today. We're trying to provide a really cool tracking experience. Because every time you get outdoors, you see something new and everything comes back to tracking. Birds, uh, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, it spans across all wildlife. So with that, we're gonna do a very quick intro. Uh, my name is Ahiga Sandoval. I'm a wildlife researcher with Pathways for Wildlife. Hi, Diamond, wildlife ecologist, other half of Pathways for Wildlife. And really quick what we do. So Tanya and I created Pathways for Wildlife. We are an organization that specializes in conducting wildlife connectivity studies. So what this means is we collect data on how wildlife travel across the landscape, how they move throughout valley floors, and especially how they attempt to cross highways and roads. And tracking data. So tracking data is at the core of our research. It helps us determine where we set up our cameras, where we uh, conduct our roadkill uh, surveys, and how we find wildlife. Here's an example of some of our cameras strategically placed based on wildlife tracking. So today we're really excited about today's presentation. So we'll do a quick review of some of the, the basics that we went over and build on that today. Building on that, um, going through things like fronts versus hinds um, for coyote, skunk, and felines. Left versus right. One of my favorites for felines, you can actually tell male versus female, especially for things like bobcats and mountain lion. Um, then we'll get into some animal communication and look at some really fun videos we've recorded for the Southern Santa Cruz Mountains Wildlife Connectivity Project that Mark mentioned that we're working with Post and the Habitat Agency and others. Um, and then we're gonna get into bird tracks, which is one of my favorite. Uh, then we'll end with small mammal tracks. And then some great folks had some uh, questions from the last workshop about recommended guides, guides that you can take out to the field and uh, continue le learning and building from. Okay, so let's begin, let's review. Um, these two tracks we covered in part one, I want you to take a good look at these tracks and let's try to identify them based on our uh, toolkit that we learned last time. So let's get a good look. Okay, so what species is this and why? Okay. So we'll a second. Does anyone want to go for it? Yeah, we'll leave, a, we'll leave some time for people to- yeah, We're looking at the chat. Okay, so let's go through our toolkit. It's a bobcat, right? Because for one, it's in snow, so the substrate is pretty soft. No claws show. So even in deep snow, no claws are present. Next, you have two high lobes at the top. There we are. And three lobes at the bottom. 
So this uh, creates that perfect trapezoid or the M-shaped path. Then it's asymmetrical right there. So you can tell the difference between left and right. And if you fold it on top of each other, it does not match up. Next, the species to the right. What is this and why? And I want to say good job, Libby. She said cat, so she nailed that. that yes. Cat. Perfect. Okay. And we have one of my favorite animals, the coyote. So in the snow, compared to the bobcat track, look at those two claws showing uh, little, just little dots at the front in snow. Next, you have the one high lobe at top, two lobes at the bottom, perfect arrowhead shaped, uh, or as Tanya likes to say, a triangular shaped pad. And also, it is almost perfectly symmetrical. There's a little asymmetry, but pretty much if you fold it on top of each other, both sides would match up. Okay, so that was good. Nice, Camille nailed that one, thank you. Yes, Next, now you're hiking, you come across this track. Tanya, you wanna go through this one? Yeah, so a lot of, of folks, when we go out tracking domestic dog, and that used to really trip me up too. I would get really excited to see a big track and big toes and, you know, oh, is that a mountain lion? And then uh, there's some really good telltale signs. So number one, we have a triangular shaped pad. That's our, our first uh, toolbox that we want, or our, our first tool we want to go in our tracking toolbox. So look at that pad, very triangular shape. One high low. The other super telltale, if you're looking at a big track and you can't quite see that pad, look for claws. If those are big, blunt claws, then you're looking at a domestic dog. And then overall, the track is symmetrical. So, so we're... So we're looking at a beautiful domestic dog track. We always get pictures of this track and people go, oh, look, I found a mountain lion track. And we're like, we feel so bad because it's like, no, that's a dog track, especially when they're really splayed out. So awesome. Domestic dog, you guys got it? Yeah, everyone's doing great. Um, and so then looking at what if you roll up and you see maybe tracks that aren't quite well defined and you were looking at something that could maybe be like a shepherd dog that would be the same kind of body size of a coyote. There's a wonderful telltale whale way to tell the difference between a coyote and a domestic dog. It's one of my favorite things, my go-tos. Before I even look at the claws, I will look for that front and that hind track because the hind pad of a coyote is much smaller than the front of a coyote. So let's look at that. So hind track slight, slightly smaller and the hind track much smaller compared to that front track. And that is such a helpful way when you're looking at, could it be a smaller dog, you know, kind of shepherd dog, but that hind track of coyote is always smaller compared to a domestic dog, the front and the hind track will be similar in size. So there's our hind and there's our front of the coyote. So let's look at coyote versus domestic dog together side by side. So that coyote has that smaller hind pad. So if you see a couple of tracks in a row, try and find the hind. It's much smaller than the front. You're looking at a coyote. And then the claw tips, as he was saying, they, the very two top ones register sharply versus the, um, the claw set back on toes two and five. Those often don't register. And then the top just register like little pinpricks versus domestic dog you're gonna get big blunt claws and a very splayed out track compared to, as someone mentioned, I think it was Camille, the tight track of a coyote. And the overall shape makes a rectangular shape. So those are definitely great ways because domestic dog versus coyote versus mountain lion, um, it's tricky. So yeah, the claw marks and then looking for that hind pad, if it's small and round compared to the front, you're looking at a coyote versus a domestic dog. Look how splayed out it is. Yeah, very splayed compared to that tight shape of the coyote. Okay, so Bobcat now. Let's go uh, over front versus hind tracks. This is actually really tricky uh, it was very tricky for me in the beginning because, uh, it, you know, as you're, as you're trailing an animal 
and you see multiple footsteps, you're like, oh, you, it's easy to get confused, but there's some things that you can do. So take a look at the top picture and just in your mind, think about what you think the front track is and what the hind track is. And real quick, I would like to just throw out there, just think about this as we're going. How much do you think a bobcat weighs? Okay, just think about that. And I'll reveal the answer right after this. Okay, so the front track of a bobcat and the all felines, it's where they carry their weight. How they attack their prey, it's like us, our hands. They're, it's very useful, those front tracks. The front track is thicker, it's wider, and it's more asymmetrical. So with that in mind, the hand, and the hind track is longer than it is wide, so it's it's more narrow is what we call it, and the front track is wide. So with that in mind, which one is the front and which one is the hind? Just take, just give you a moment to look at that. Look at the asymmetry. Which one is more asymmetrical? And with that, we'll have our answer. So the one on the bottom is the front, and the one on the top is the hind. And look at the pad. The metal, it's what we call the metacarpal pad. Do you see how thick it is in the front compared to the hind? In if you see a hind track of a mountain lion or a bobcat, it's it'll be very difficult to uh, to discern it from left to right, or at least for me sometimes. The front is where you can see, okay, that's a front left, that's a front right, or, or so on. So now, let's do that. Let's go over the front versus left, or uh, the right versus left. Do you think the bottom picture is right or left of a bobcat? So the left, uh, this is what we do. It's kind of like our hands. If you take a look at your hand, toe one, which is the thumb, it's regressed. It's up here on, on, on cats. So what you do is you find the next highest toe, which is the middle finger. Then what you do is you count, or you uh, you slope it down like so, and that is toe four and toe five. So right when you right when you see that, you know it's either a right or a left. So what is this track? It's a right, right front and right hind. Perfect. So. Doing that again, because that can definitely be a little tricky. So just like he was saying, so you, you have a front pad and you look for the highest toe. And just like it was he was, yeah, when I'm in the field, I'll, I'll look for the highest toe and I will literally compare my left hand to the right hand and I will place it right by the track. Look for that highest toe, trace the line down. And so just holding up your different hands, you would compare and then you could see that from the highest toe, tracing down, it's a right. And it's a right hind because the pad's so much smaller. Once again, we look for the highest toe on the top. Trace that down. You can literally hold your hands up. And what hand does that match? That's going to match my right. And it's a larger pad, so it's a right hand. I'm sorry, it's a right hind. So really fun stuff to do out in the field. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, when you're looking for those too high, the highest toe, I literally, when I'm in the field, I just take a little stick and I'll just put it across and it's really, oh, there's that high toe. And then you just trace it down. Okay, let's, before we get into this, let's reveal the answer. So uh, with uh, POST and the Open Space Authority, we were involved in a, a Bobcat study with Chris Wilmers, amazing study. And my job, it's it's very stressful on the animals because you know they are going through something that's not natural to them. But it was our job to make sure they were safe. And my job, specifically right when we got there, was to measure the animal, make sure they were healthy. So how much do you think a bobcat weighs in our area, in California, in the Bay Area, Coyote Valley? Well, the answer is the heaviest bobcat we got was 21 pounds. So a 21 pound animal left these tracks. So just think about that. And every time you see an animal, just try to guess its weight. It's a really good thing to do and it, it, it will show in the track. Okay, so quick review. Obviously feline tracks. Is this left or right? Well, you find the highest toe, slope down, and it's a left. Perfect. Now, which is the front and which is the hind? Well, from our toolbox, we know that 
if the, the, the front track is more splayed out, it's more asymmetrical. The rear track is more narrow. It's longer than it is wide. That will help us with our answer. Check that out. That's the left hind. That's the left front. And we'll just leave it there for a second so you can take that in. Okay. Awesome. Folks are doing great. We have folks saying left, so we're, we're yeah. talking virtually. <laughs> okay. Now I, I I love this track. This is my skunk. We went over we went over this in part one, but we didn't get to cover the front and the and the back. This is this is a um a really good lead into to more advanced tracking because we're starting to approach something that's kind of unique with animals, and that is the fusing of the pads. Okay, so uh, skunks they dig a lot, and the more flexibility you have. It's kind of it's kind of like this off balance that evolution has created, where the more flexible you are, the quicker you are, but you kind of it's it's less power that you have. So skunks have evolved, their front their front track, their front paw, it's fused together, and it makes it stronger. That's because because they dig and they need that for digging. Okay, so both front and track are asymmetrical. There's five toes in the front and the back, but then when you start to differ the front and the back you start to see three layers. Those three layers are here. So this will help you figure out what's front and what's hind. So locate the tracks with the three layered appearance we went over in part one. So toes, the pad, and then the, the back metacarpal pad. And that is right there. So we've identif we identified two tracks with that three layered uh, pad, that what I like to call the three layered uh, stacking of the pads. Okay. so. What about the front? Well, skunks evolved to have really strong uh, front tracks. So the claws are gonna be very prominent. What tracks show the claws? These ones. Okay, so now we know. What is the hind and what is the front? There we are, that's the hind and these are the front. Perfect, nice little skunk gallop. Okay. Uh, this is one of my favorites. When uh, I first started tracking, I would see different, especially bobcats, I would see different size tracks. And I wasn't sure what I was looking at. I, I thought it was actually a, a juvenile versus an older bobcat thing. But what I didn't understand, it was a female versus male thing. And we were so honored uh, to have Mark Elbrock come out and Casey McFarland. And they went over this with us. And it was really exciting to learn the difference between a male and female bobcat and you can do this with felines um so you can also do this with mountain lions which is really exciting you have to have a really good track so we uh, pick these two pictures because they're just perfect tracks in mud so to begin with males they have very robust and round toes the toes are also much closer to the pad there's not a lot of space between the toes and the pad and the pads are wider on the sides compared to the female that have very tear-shaped toes. And there's a lot more space between the toes and the pad. So we call that negative space. There's a lot more space where the toes come down before they meet the pad. And then really interestingly, the pads are much more concave on the side compared to the wider uh, pad of the males. So super fascinating. So when you get to a really good track and you can spend some time, you know, we'll look at front versus hind, left versus right. And then we get great tracks like this. You can actually look into, is this a male versus female? Uh, so this was a, a lot of fun to learn and really just took it to the whole next level. So this is definitely very advanced tracking, um, but it just shows how much information and data you can get from a track. Um, this was really great because the female track was a, a bobcat that we were recording on camera and she was routinely going back and forth under a bridge on 68 um, down our project that we're working down with with Caltrans and we had gone down there with uh, Morgan Robertson and we were looking at these different tracks and we'd been recording this female going back and forth with her kittens. She had three different litters. So that was really exciting. So whenever we saw this female tracks, uh, we, we, we record her with her kittens. So. Uh, definitely advanced, but really fun. And it shows how much information you can extract from um, just one track. Great, so uh, getting into animal communication, which is just amazing. 
Um, there's so many ways to communicate with each other from scent marking to scrapes to scat, leaving latrines. Uh, I always say it's like they're just leaving their business card for others to, to read the card and see who is there. Um, so this video blew our minds when we had set up, when Ahiga had set up this camera at the culvert along 152. And we were so amazed and shocked when we saw that other set of eyes coming through the culvert. At first I thought, oh, it was probably another badger. We did not expect that it was a coyote. And there's been a lot of different studies that have noted that coyotes and badgers will hunt together. And I always thought that it was really the coyotes taking care, advantage of the badger. The badger would dig and the ground squirrels would run off and the coyote would get the ground squirrel. But did the coyote ever bring the badger a ground squirrel? There wasn't a lot of information on that. So were they cooperatively hunting as friends or was the coyote just taking advantage of the badger? So I wondered about this for a good 10 years and then this video definitely uh, solve that mystery for me. A caddy does a really interesting thing here, it does like a play bow, it's a friendly bounce, like, come on, let's go. So I think this was one of the most amazing camera video footage that I learned about communication between animals. Let's look at some other communication. spray marking. So bobcats actually do a lot of spraying. And at first I thought it was just a, a male thing, but females will do that too. More marking at the culvert. By coyote, and then the coyote goes through the culvert. And then skunks. Even the skunk is letting everyone know that it was there. So there's some more marking behavior. They're part of the Mastillidae uh, family, so they have glands, so they're marking. This one, you've probably seen your domestic cats with their mouth open. What is that, he the Fleming response? Yeah, if you if you caught that, uh, the bobcat will like, like cats when they smell. I learned this from uh, a gentleman by the name of Max Allen with the UC Santa Cruz Puma team. He has a whole paper on it, but what uh, the Pumas will do is they'll raise, they'll curl up their upper lip like so, and they have, uh, they're basically getting um, more of the scent in to identify, and they'll do that a lot, and it's really cool. So the bobcat actually did that there, and you can see it uh, slightly. Look at that right again. So look at its mouth. See? Uh, house cats will do this too. Mount lions do it. They're, uh, picturing, they're, they're uh, picking up more from the scent from their olfactory senses. Again. Almost like, like almost like tasting it, yes. Yes, yes. I used to make fun of my cats when they did that until I realized that it was actually a very cool and important way to communicate with each other. So even our famous badger was reading those business cards, learning who was there. As you can see, this is a very busy area. <laughs> And that's one of the fascinating things about these culvert locations. So as we're doing studies, we're learning more and more um, that these culverts are, are bottleneck areas. They're locations which are helping wildlife safely cross under the road, but it's also funneling animals across the landscape. So their territorial boundaries, they have to overlap as they share these um, important locations for safe passage. So the more safe passages and locations that we can provide these animals where they're bundling underneath the highway is important. You know, it's incredible because these locations are meant for water, not for wildlife. You know, there's very few wildlife crossings. Um, but with studies like this, we have big plans on installing a lot more uh, different structures, overpasses, underpasses, culverts. So there's more of these structures for animals to, to move under because when you set up a camera, it's fascinating to see the communication and how they're sharing this one culvert and how important it is that they're going underneath the road and not being hit on top of it. Okay, let's get into some, it's a loud video. Let's get into some uh, cool scrape behavior. So other than tracks, uh, wildlife, especially cats, will leave other signs. We call these scraping. So do you see that? Can you try to keep that again? So this is a perfect scrape of a bobcat. You can see it scoping out the area. It's looking around. And with its hind feet, 
it'll either scat, urinate, or just make a scrape pile. It's marking its territory. It's communicating with other bobcats and other wildlife at this very busy intersection here. Look at that. Look at the back feet work on the ground. So that's a bobcat scrape. That's not the only animal that does that. There's also this animal. And check this out. Look at the difference. Look at the big mound of dirt. It's pushing behind him. Again, this, oh, this is a male, by the way. Again, it's marking its territory. It's saying that I'm here. And it'll defecate, it'll urinate, and it'll even just uh, just leave a, a, a scrape site. The difference between, if you come across this, the difference between a bobcat scrape and the mountain lion scrape is not in the length or the depth, because that depends on substrate. So what trackers and biologists will do is they'll measure the width, because the, the paw of a mountain lion, the rear paw, is like twice the size of the paw of a bobcat. So when you have two of those paws working, it leaves a wider area and you can measure that. It's the most reliable uh, way to measure. And uh, here's a perspective. Try to get as comfortable as you can with um, dividing up your measurement techniques into sixteenths, because that's the most accurate you can get. Uh, so Bobcat is three to seven and a half inches wide, okay? So you have that. Then if you go to Mount Lion, at the high end of a Bobcat, it's like very, there's very little overlap. It'll be seven to 11 inches wide. And there's, uh, and areas like San Vicente Redwoods, which uh, is post property, they are, there's so many scrapes there because there's lots of, there's lots of healthy pumas and they're communicating back and forth. So that's cool. And just to stay on the slide for a second, um, someone had a great question that I want to address, but also this was really exciting because we recorded this for the Midpen Badger study. So this camera was actually out here looking for badgers. So we we're uh, really excited when we came to check the camera and we just saw a huge scrape mark and you know, I was like oh please let that be right in front of the camera so when you're out there on your hikes and you've probably seen you know some scat and then a you know big scrape mark and look at that with like he was saying you know is that bobcat scat which we'll get to next um, and a scrape or if you just see a scrape you know we'll measure it out versus that's bobcat versus mountain lion and um, Chris Wilmers did a, an amazing paper speaking of communication where he found for mountain lions specifically when there was just too much housing development mountain lions didn't do this communication they were communicating with each other they were just quickly trying to get from a to b avoiding um human places so when we see scrapes like this we know ah this is good this animal's communicating it feels comfortable it has enough space to stop and take the time and feel safe enough to communicate with other mountain lions which is really important because when you have a huge home range and the female lives way over on the next range over, you know, how are you going to find each other? So these types of communications are really vital in terms of, you know, finding viable mates um, for juveniles to know, oh, that's a big male residing here. I need to move on. And Libby had a question about the cameras. We tend to keep them a little farther back from the entrance. What was the question? How close is that camera to the culvert entrance? Great question. Oh, this was like 30 feet. Yeah, this was like 30 feet. And the cameras that we use are infrared no glow because the last thing we want to do is spook an animal to not use a culvert or to go across on top of the road. So these cameras, uh, they don't flash. They don't even have that little red infrared glow. Um, they're more expensive, but definitely worth it. So animals just don't even tend to see it. Yeah, unfortunately, all cameras, even the blackout ones, you can still see a little bit of the glow and animals do notice it. Um, so that, that that's a big question, especially like with, for example, for our research, like this is out way out there. It's a kind of a hidden area in the Midpen property, one of my favorites. Um, but the other areas were near highways and roads, and we're working we're working uh, on the Southern Santa Cruz um, Wildlife Connectivity Study with Post, and we set up our cameras, and we would have cameras on both sides. Well, bobcats, mountain lion, gray fox, deer, they don't seem to notice them too much. I mean, they, you know, they, they'll look, they'll even mark our cameras, like spray on them, but it's the coyotes that kind of, um, they, they, they're really um, nervous. Like you could see their timid behavior. Um, and even one time we were monitoring this culvert and we had cameras on both sides and one went off and it was up, we put it on video and the coyote went through and the other one went off. Right when that happened, the coyote backed out. So as soon as we saw that, we removed the cameras because that's, uh, you know, like we're actually interfering with their, their travel route. So that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we tried to be very careful, very invasive with our, our work out there. So, yeah, we don't want to influence any type of movement. So that, yeah, the higher quality cameras are definitely worth it. 
we definitely never use flash. Good so question. Going back into the scrape, I'm sure lots of you have seen this on the ground next to your hikes. So <laughs> go over scat. Okay, so Bobcat scat. I, this is this is really um, like if this is in our search image because of the Bobcat study, and they're just it's a common scat that you see. Um, and it looks so like in my culture we say like it looks like someone got mud and packed it together. But I like Tonya's Tonya's wording. Um, it's boxy and segmented, so you can see that here. Um, and by segments, meaning like when it breaks apart, it breaks apart at those seams, at those joints, or at that segment. Um, that's why we say like it's mud packed together. Like if you got mud ball packed to get together, it would separate right at the pack. Um, also, it's a uh, there's lots of bones and fur. Um, they're carnivores, so you'll see like small teeth, small bones, stuff like that. And it's pretty smooth compared to um, coyote scat, which is almost the only other scat that you can you can confuse it with, other than domestic cat scat sometimes, or that, which are feral. And the, use my, my favorite thing that I also call them is that they look like Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see, you're, you're good at that. Um, <laughs> the length, so th three to nine inches long. And the diameter seven by uh, seven by six uh, seven sixteenths and almost one inch. Okay, so next, mount lion scat. So the way I like to think of this is it's very similar to, to uh, bobcat scat in terms of like the boxing segmented. So you can see that here. It's just much larger, but the, again, just like the scrape. Here's the key. Like like people will say, um, okay, well, how can you tell like a juvenile mount lion with like an adult bobcat? Well, the key is in the width, not the length. The length, it's you. You'll get uh, extremely confused. A lot of trackers go through this. I, I'm like, oh, maybe the length. You know, it's it's not in the length because scat varies a lot. Uh, it's actually in the width. So the diameter is um, six and a half inches. Or, or the length is six and a half inches to 17 inches long. So it's a long scat. But like I said, it's segmented, so it'll break. Like like this scat here, it'll break up and you'll get confused with the length. So, and over time it'll break up. So go by the diameter. It's almost, it's so the top end is an inch and five eighths, which is quite round. And no, um, usually bobcats, they don't they don't go higher than one inch. So that's good. And then obviously bones for, we found pig teeth and scat before. So uh, larger prey and overall uh, wider scat. And then, this I like this comparison because you have, so we have our boxy segment of feline scat compared to the upper right is ropey twisted coyote scat. So that's a really good way to um, look at those two different species. So your coyote is gonna have really, it'll, it'll be similar in length to bobcat um, and even in width, but it'll be very ropey and twisty compared to that boxy segmentation that you find in uh, felines. Yeah, so uh, another thing, so, uh, a lot of times, like w when Tanya and I first met, we're using like these different references. Try to think of stuff that reminds uh, you of that that uh, evidence that you find. So, for example, uh, a lot of Southwest trackers will say like the coyote scat looks braided. You could see like the contours in it, whereas the bobcat scat, like I said, is like compacted mud. So uh, when Tanya says ropey and twisty, I like that because it, it, it looks like a rope, like someone uh, twisted it together. And you can really see the, the twist on that coyote scat in the upper right. Oh, and before we moved on, someone asked a good question because we don't have a slide on this raccoon scat. Raccoon Ooh, scat yeah. can often be, um, it'll look a lot like bobcat scat, but the difference is uh, the what's in the scat. So raccoons are omnivores. So you'll often, often see you know berries, um, the shell of berries, a lot of fruit, um, more vegetation. Um, and then they also tend to have latrines um, as well. So yeah, bobcat versus raccoon can be tricky, but um, another thing, it's, we call it the squish test. Uh, bobcats, it's very hard and compact because they're obligate carnivores, so it's just really compact versus raccoons, very squishy because it's not all that compact um, prey material. It, it consists of things like berries and, and other things that they're eating, so and fish and shellfish. So uh, great question because those two can be tricky. Yeah, my best thing is that I think of raccoon scat. Actually, to me, it reminds me of like miniature bear scat. So it's dark and it's very grainy. Uh, like I said, like the um, the bobcat scat is smooth and the uh, the coyote scat is twisted, twisty and, ro and ropey. 
And to me, uh, 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 raccoon scat is very grainy. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. good question. Yeah, great questions. Uh, then last one on that, uh, similar to canines. Yeah, that's tricky. The, the great fox scat looks like coyote scat, but it's it's like a quarter of the size, so small. Very thin. Uh, very, very thin. And then domestic dog, uh, it's like the raccoon, very grainy because they're eating dog food versus uh, prey species. So, um, yeah, great questions. Okay, so um, getting into bird tracks. When so, so when I first started tracking, I was blown away at bird tracks, and and as I learned, bird tracks I thought might be really tricky or hard, and I talked with others, but they're really not. They're very well defined, just like our mammal tracks, and just like our mammal tracking toolbox. There's definitely different tools that we use to identify different bird tracks and by species. And um, it's really interesting. So I, I'm going to start with this diagram, just showing the different mechanics of what the tracks can look like. And we'll look into each species. And at the end of this, when we look at this again, I hope you'll be like, OK, that's, that is this species versus that species. So just a little bit going over the bird feed configurations, because that's a really important part of an understanding the difference between the different species. So we have anisodactyl feet, and these are perching feet. And this is very common for jays, hawks, and small perching birds, where you have a different toe configuration versus a zygodactyl, a clinging foot. And that's a whole different toe configuration. And we see the optimum with the woodpeckers. So in an antisodactyl foot, the trick of it is that there's three toes in the front versus the one toe, digit one, which is a helix, in the back. Then looking at the zygodactyl feet, the trick of that is you're looking at two toes in the front and then two toes in the back. So those are our two types of foot structures. Um, and we're, we're starting with the, the basics here, but those two will really help you understand the different types of uh, tracks by different species. So there's digit one and four in the back versus just digit one in the antisodactyl foot. So just a, a zoomed in look at that digit one, that helix, how it's used to cling onto the branch. So this is one of my favorite ever. Uh, I was so fortunate to uh, have Casey McFarlane. We'll chat about him at the end of the, the workshop, but he's a um, master tracker in tracks throughout the world. And he taught me about Corvid tracks. And what's really cool about Corvid tracks is whether you're looking at a crow or a jay, any of the Corvids, they have very, very similar features. And one of the predominant features is that Helix, a helix digit, digit one, and that toe faces back and has a very defined snow cone shape. And then the other thing is it has a 45 degree angle between the two outer toes. And that is every time you're looking at a corvid, so you're just really looking at the size versus a, a crow versus a stellar jay but you're looking at that helix, which is so well defined. And you see those three dots that almost look like a snow cone shape. And then looking at the 43, 45 degree angle between those outer toes. And just a close up look at a real crow. And so here we have digit one used for perching and gripping onto branches. So you can see how it's using that, that helix. It's very big, very well defined digit one. Versus plovers, the helix hardly does not even register because they're not a perching bird. They're a wading bird. They're walking around. They don't need that digit one for clinging onto branches. And the difference between the angles between the toes is you have a 45 degree angle between all the toes, not just the outer toes, but between each toe. And a close up look, one of my favorite, the uh, Look, the little blast raptors running around, but you can see that the helix is often too small to even register. So looking at a plover foot versus crow feet, so different versus just looking at where 
that helix one is registering. If it's not registering and you have the same angles, you're looking at a waiting bird versus a perching bird. This is one of my favorites, great horn owl tracks. Super interesting because they are zygodactyl. Two toes actually point towards the front and the back. So what is going on in this picture? Well, unlike most other zygodactyl birds, owl feet are unique in that they can also rotate one, toward, one toe forward to help them grip and walk. It's a unique thing to owls. That outer toe can rotate up, which is fascinating because woodpeckers, they can't do that. And the helix and claw strongly register. And keep that in mind when we look at uh, something like a wild turkey. So here's a, a picture and it shows that that outer toe on the front, front foot, I'm sorry, the outer toe on each foot can swivel. So owls are able to do this because of that uniquely flexible joint, which is just fascinating. We we're really fortunate for this video, the bald eagle. One of my that favorite videos. Mm -hmm. And this was for the habitat agency and the work that we're doing with them in Pacheco Creek. This is really exciting uh, because eagles do walk around on the ground and you can find their tracks. So eagle and hot tracks in a sedactyl. So they, unlike the owls, have three toes pointing forward one long toe pointing backwards. That's your difference if you're looking at a track between an eagle or hawk and an owl. So that's really fascinating in terms of their toe placement and structure. So then let's compare a turkey vulture versus a wild turkey. I had gotten this wrong on one of my tracking evals, so I never forgot it. This is such a fantastic picture taken by Jonah Evans um, of a turkey vulture actually eating a fish, which is so cool because you see the fish. So the difference between looking at a turkey vulture and a wild turkey is that the outer toes are smaller in the middle and the halos and claw often register. So keep that in mind, the halos and claw often register. And here's a picture of turkey foot. So you can see those two toes are set way back with that middle being very, very long. Versus a wild turkey, that halos often does not register in the track. So that was where I got it wrong. I was like, oh, so you're looking at that helix. So that digit one, that helix is really important when you're looking at all bird tracks. Does it register? Where's the placement? So for wild turkey, why isn't it registering very well? Well, it's due to the way that they stand and walk. They put more pressure on their front toes while walking. And that's the difference between turkey vultures, which are walking more flat and everything's registering. And there, there is where you would look. So you just see the the claw of the helix, but not the digit itself. A great picture, uh, I thought this was great looking at it. It's almost like they're, they're walking kind of like on their tiptoes. So again, that helix isn't registering. And then one of my favorites, the woodpeckers, just such crazy cool feet. So psychodactyl, so you have that first helix and the fourth facing backward while the second and third toes face frontward. So two toes in the front, two toes in the back. And that's uh, evolved to meet their lifestyle. So this is this foot arrangement is good for grasping limbs and trunks and trees, walking up and down, um, just amazing. So really cool evolution of the feet. So here's that stencil that we were looking at at the very beginning. So instead of it being a mystery like it used to be to me, I was like, okay, woodpeckers, look at that toe arrangement. Wild turkey, you're not gonna see that helix. Plovers, not gonna see that helix either. Look at the angles between the toes. The owl has that great swivel toe. Turkey vulture, you're gonna see that digit one register. And corvids have that really cool ice cream shaped, cone shaped helix. And then the 45 degree angle between those outer toes. So just a, a little deep dive into bird tracking, but it's quite fascinating. Um, I think just as cool as mammal tracking. It's so impressive how how you could tell like like so many species apart with the birds, you know. Okay, 
So with this, let's get into uh, some squirrel tracks. I love small mammal tracking. Um, it's a good sign of like how healthy the ecosystem is. And everywhere where we've had a lot of bobcats, coyotes, great fox, pumas, and the all of our top predators, there's a good source of uh, small mammals, rodents. And uh, let's go over some of those tracks because I think they're cool. Um, the key here is though size. Measurements really matter. And this is why I say try to get a ruler with uh, divisions of sixteenths, so you can tell like you know one through sixteenth it counts up to an inch, and um, a few sixteenths of an inch can make a big difference in the in the identification of a track. So here we go. So just like like most rod rodents, um, they do have five toes in the front, but they don't show. Not all of them show. They become vestigial, like uh, they, they're kind of like just nubs, and they're not really used. It's these uh, fingers that are used. Uh, toes two through five um, and that's how you can tell the front and the back which is pretty cool so take a look at this picture and let's see if we could tell which which track has five toes and which track has four okay we got it the front is in the circles and the hinds and the squares see the five digits and the good news is they're um, they're asymmetrical so we can tell which we can tell left from right also, there's kind of like a uh, what, what I call an inward curve. So like uh, squirrel tracks are pretty straight, but they're just bowed just a little bit. And if you see the highlighted yellow, that's that's where the um, you can kind of tell where it kind of just leans to the uh, area, giving away if it's a left or a right. OK, next, the toes are long and lean um, of a tree squirrel. This is because they project themselves, they're climbing and their their whole body, their whole body weight is like they're ready to pounce. You can even tell like the front track is the front tracks are set behind the back. It's like over dramatized because they project themselves. They, they do a lot of leaping. And it's because they can uh, they climb trees. So they also have like a bulbous tip, uh, what I call like a bulbous toe tip. So it's like a fingertip that they have. Okay, and the front is one and one quarter of an inch, two two inches. So it's not a very big track. The reason why these are more advanced track is because you have to get a closer look and sometimes you need a really good track and good substrate. Okay, next, another squirrel that we have. Uh, we did a study with Morgan Gray from uh, UC Berkeley with uh, Open Space Authority and it was cool. We would go around uh, collecting ground squirrel scat to see if there was differentiation between the east side of 101 and the west side of 101 and if there was connectivity in between. What we found was pretty impressive there was a lack of connectivity. Um, unfortunately, ground squirrels get hit a lot, but they leave their scats behind and their track is pretty cool because they are diggers just like badgers. Um, again, the usual rodent setup, five toes in the rear, four, uh, four toes in the front and five toes in the back. So here is a hind track. Also, there's these four uh, distinct, what I call knuckles. So they're actually, it's actually the, um, the metatarsal, but it, it, it's like there's only four of them, and you'll see those in the track. And that that's the that giveaway of what the ground squirrel is, and also the toes. So the difference in the difference in the uh, structure of the toes compared to a tree squirrel is the blunt, thicker, powerful claws. Like they they just look more sturdy because ground squirrels are constantly digging. They're like badgers, and they're constantly running back and forth. They're like little sprinters. They're not, they don't need to project themselves like tree squirrels. They're a little bit like heavier. Um, they're, more, they're more planted. So they have a thicker uh, track, like a thicker, thicker set of fingers. Also, they're asymmetrical. Uh, so you can tell left and right, and like this one, obviously a right track. You can tell how, uh, like just how, um, pigeon toed they are. They're much more asymmetrical compared to a tree squirrel. And uh, the tracks, the track size is very similar from the front and the hind. They're both powerful. So again, there's that one to one 13 sixteenths of an inch. So that's almost up to two inches. I love ground squirrels. Okay, next. So here's, here's them side by side. And this, I love this picture because you can really tell the difference in the leanness and the powerfulness. So tree squirrels, long, lean, straight with a slight but slight inward curve, bulbous fingertips for gripping onto branches and such. Ground squirrel, short, powerful, much more asymmetric, asymmetrical and um, much more powerful. But both have that setup. Four toes in the front track, five toes in the rear. Okay, like they look like little, little wolverines. 
another animal. Uh, this is actually one of our neighbors. We have a wood rat living under our house, which I see all the time. Um, I love them. They're really cool. Uh, I like coming across uh, wood rat nests. They're just so like creative, you know, it's like a their little shelter. So the front track is very round, like so. Most rodent tracks, when you get to this size, it's kind of tough to get to orientate yourself because you're like, wow, they have these back pads um, and it can really throw you off. Like what direction is, is this track facing? Um, the toes are short and round, which doesn't help with identification because like I said, they have those back metacarpal pads, um, but there are the toes, they're larger. And once you find the palm, uh, once you find that, that pad, you know what you're dealing with and you're like, okay, I know which direction this animal's headed and those are the back proximal pads. It's like the, it's almost like if you put your hand in sand, you'll see like the bottom of your paw, of your handprint. It's that hitting the ground, and that helps with traction, climbing, running, digging, moving stuff around. They're asymmetrical, and they're a little less than an inch long. Okay. And there's that asymmetry. You can really tell, especially in the front tracks. Um, here's a cool tip: most things with five toes. You could tell it's if it's asymmetrical when the five toes uh, are visible. I mean, so like, you know, pumas will have five toes, but they're they're regressed. But the rodents, you can really tell left and right, which really helps because they leave a lot of tracks. Okay. Next wild animal. So I I love this one because it's another track I would see um, in my early tracking days and just be like, what? there's no pad and it's just like these weird claws with toes. What is this? And this was great because we were on a tracking evaluation again with uh, Casey McFarland and Mark Elbrock and a lot of, you know, really good trackers were sitting looking at this, you know, was it weasel? What was it? Well, it turned out to be a jackrabbit um, because the pads are so so furry. They're covered by fur that the pads hardly register. So if you're walking along and doing some tracking, you just see these toes with these little claws sticking out and it's not very large, so, you know, not, not like a badger or anything like that. Um, you're perhaps looking at a jackrabbit. So that's one of my, my favorite little mystery tracks. Versus if you're looking at a weasel, you'll have five toes and you will see the pad. We're going to update our website pretty soon, but we'll, we'll notify you whenever there's a, a cyber tracker um, evaluation in our area because people fail this big time. To me, I, I I never got it right in the beginning. I was like, this is like a it's like a um, uh, weasel or something, like some vicious animal. But it's a, uh, it, you know, a lot of people get fooled. It's it's a rabbit. Yeah, yeah, very vicious looking tracks for a rabbit. <laughs> and they're just at that point where they're big enough to be like confused with like a gray fox or uh, mm -hmm. uh, a red fox. Uh, th that's actually what people say. By the way, they'll be like, oh, it's a red fox. But it's like, no. Okay. A good one. So next. Um, I want to thank uh, Janie Craig had asked uh, from our first tracking workshop, what were some good uh, guides to use? So we want to end the workshop with some of our favorite guides that we use. This one's fantastic because it's just a nice laminated folded something you can put in your pack or your pocket. And it's Mark Elbrock's tracking guide, uh, local tracks of North America. And I love it because not only does it have the beautiful drawings and diagrams, but it'll have a picture of a track like in a mud or sand. So you have two things to look and compare for um, with its sizes. And uh, he packed just full, I couldn't believe how many different species. And someone asked about snake tracks. They do leave tracks. And actually, as you hold this uh, brochure out, there's insect tracks in there. I think he has snake and there's some scat and bird tracks. So it's a great, it's one of my favorite guides and it's very, very affordable, under $10. Um, Lisa Myers, she carries this at her bird store in Las Gatas along with other guides. Um, oops, sorry, some of the, our other favorite tracks. Uh, so this was exciting because uh, Markel Brock had done a minimal track sign of North America, a wonderful book. Um, but then they even dialed down even more to animal tracks and scat of California. So yay, we have our own guide. And you saw a lot of pictures here from Jonah Evans. He was a contributor and one of the authors of this book. He's an amazing, incredible tracker. Um, and then there's even a bird and track sign. So that's where I did a lot of my learning and applied what I learned um, birds and track sign from this book out into the field. So these are some wonderful guides 
um, that can help with your education because you can see you can 12, you could spend half your life learning bird tracks and the next half learning small mammal tracks. And I mentioned Casey McFarland. So he's president of Cyber Tracker and they host tracking certifications and trainings. And these are just amazing. You spend two days and they immerse you out there and they will look at track and sign. They will ask you questions. It's like a big quiz and then they go over everything. And then you can actually get certified as a level one, two, three or a master tracker. So it's for me, a lifelong training. And uh, we are absolutely going to have Casey McFarlane out, something we hope we can host like with mid pen and post and OSA um, and go out into the field and continue this journey. And then you can actually become a certified wildlife tracker, which is really cool to put on your resume for sure and you'll walk away with so much more knowledge Casey goes into wool runs to different digs I mean um, he'll show you a twig and say what ate this and then he'll say look at the angle this was a wood rat versus a deer it's just an incredible learning experience um, male versus female chats that we went over so uh, we will make sure to post when Casey comes out because uh, there's only about 20 folks or so and it is one of the most amazing experiences, a great way to spend two days and we'll definitely be um, out on the trails of, of uh, our partners and doing some really cool future trackings that we hope we can do in person with you all. So thank you so much to, to Post and mid -Pen thank you, everybody. and the Authority for, for having us here. This has been so fun to do virtually with everyone. We haven't, uh, we've done some PowerPoint presentations, but this was really cool to go through and put this together. And yeah, we definitely hope to host these in person soon and get out into the field and, and do some live tracking together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and engagements. Oh man, you all are so amazing. Thank you for your time and that information. Um, there's so much thanks in the chat too. So um, thank you, Ayaga. Thank you, Tanya. That was wonderful. Thank you for having us, Mark. Yeah. Sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. I was trying to keep up there with the chat. Oh, so. you, you both did so good. You know, um, thank you all, to all of you for your great questions too. So it sounds like um, we all have a task of getting some of those guides and, you know, slowing down sometime that we want to go take a walk at one of our local preserves and take some time to look down at our feet and and practice some of this stuff. I know I have a lot of work to do. So, yeah, so um, we're at the top of the hour um, and I wanna respect everybody's time. Um, really quickly, we wanted to share the, um, email, the websites for all of our partners for this event. Um, I want to thank uh, Open Space Authority, Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, and of course, Higa and Tanya of Pathways for Wildlife for um, co hosting this series. You could check out all of their websites here, as well as posts. And for those of you who have opted into the various email lists, we'll be um, you know, following up with you in the coming weeks um, if you want to learn more about each of our organizations. We'll, we'll also share an email tomorrow with a bunch of resources related to everything that we covered. So so with that again, Tanya and Ahiga, I hope you get to um, relax this weekend. Thanks for your time. And I hope to see you in person soon. Definitely, thank you, thank you Mark. Thank you so much, Mark, this was awesome. All right, everybody. See you Bye. all. Thank you so much for, for tracking with us.